Welcome to the free audio rendering of Not Without Scars 2. Such an insightful and impactful work must be accessible to the countless number of people living similar life experiences. Becoming a best-selling author pales in comparison to creating a tool capable of instilling hope in a multitude of people trapped in the valley of decision. My greatest profit comes in helping others emerge victorious over their life struggle. My goal is to encourage individuals to follow their dream. My message, you must never quit on your faith, pursuing your aspiration or vision. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Take a moment, invite your family, friends and acquaintances and enemies to listen to this work chapter by chapter. It is free to listen as well as free to subscribe. Peace, love and phenomenal blessing. How do I write my life story? I know hurt and pain. I don't like either one, whether physical or emotional. Herein contains my story, Not Without Scars, Part 2. Optimism, perseverance, persistence, resilience. Two decades of personal struggle. Optimism, I faced a new millennium with hopefulness. Perseverance. My ego, my humble beginnings, my desire to achieve never allow me to turn away from a difficult task. Persistence. Opposition should be anticipated as an effective strategy to victory surfaces. Resilience. Difficulties do not automatically spell termination. Scars reveal my imperfection as reminders of past episodes of pain, sorrow, or triumph. Scars can tell beautiful story endings or relay misery that wishes to remain anonymous. This work is meant to help others who have experienced decades of struggle. When struggles appear to never end, you must get through the night and face the challenge of a new dawn with fresh hope. Chapter 14, The Reality of life. Introduction. It was like the king in the book of Daniel when the finger wrote on the wall. The exception, the exception being, I did not need to call upon anyone to interpret the writing. I could clearly interpret what, what others were not capable of seeing. The mystery was not in the, in, in the visible, but what yet to be written or divulged. Unwritten rules are the practices that people adhere to, whether traditions or culture edicts. These unwritten codes can govern an individual and set the loyalty or integrity that allows an individual to have a peaceful sleep at night. I live by a set of virtues that had been embedded in me as far back as I could remember. They were amplified by my life in the streets of major cities of America. Respect and integrity had become my calling card. Internally, these principles determined how I treated other people. It was not the golden rule. In fact, I think it carried an even stronger practical application. The consequences were immediate, not retribution to come at some distant time or place, or even an afterlife experience. People, who have never been in the street life can never understand the principle of taking the weight. Change cannot always wait for perfect endearment nor wide retrospective analysis. As a young boy in the rural South, I had often trailed behind Douglas, one of my older brothers and his friend. Sometimes I ran ahead only if the route was familiar with the hope of stealing a moment of rest. When that tactic failed and their pace exceeded mine and the path was new, I would yell, wait for me. Refusing to slow down, they would yell back, wait is what broke the wagon down. I was forced to push myself to keep up, to catch up or keep up, or at least remain close enough to hear my brother's voice. In this current precocious endeavor, I could not afford to wait. Any more weight might break me down, a mental breakdown, a spiritual meltdown. 
Again, I had to push myself to stay close enough to reality to hear soundness in my soul and close enough to my faith to hear guidance from the spirit. And the only recourse available when I yell back my prayers would be to find a predestined step on the venture to my foreordained destiny. I had been pressed and compressed, bent and twisted, as well as stretched and contorted. No matter what the contours of the scenario, by faith, I have been blessed to recover from all the subsequent devastation and potential ruins. I have learned to adapt to whatever has transpired while steadfastly resolving not to panic. Foremost, I have gained the knowledge to keep breathing with composure. Calm breath will prevent hyperventilation, will help maintain spirited life flow, and shall keep oxygen flowing to my brain. With this internal strategy, I have been able to make the appropriate adjustments that were necessary in order to cope with impending changes. In the face of overwhelming odds, I have labored diligently to retain control of whatever aspect of possible of an event. My older brothers, Dave and Douglas, have instructed me early as a teenager in the art of urban driving. My basic training in urban driving took place on the crowded thoroughfares of New York City. My brothers understood that within the congestion, accident would be inevitable. The premier principle, when facing an unavoidable accident, was never stop driving the vehicle. Second, I was told to choose the angle that will result in the least possible personal physical harm while modifying my speed accordingly. Third, I had received the directive to aim the vehicle for the point of impact that would yield the minimum amount of damage. Finally, I was taught to trust my instinct, to brace for impact, and steer to the point of least resistance upon collision. From those points onward, I had learned to rely on my internal compass. I would begin the odyssey to seek the roadmap to overcoming any misfortune. I might also add, resilience had never allowed me to remain in a demeaning or unnatural state. Historical. I have learned over the years that when one mind is made up, this diminishes fear. Rosa Parks. When the games are on the way, a superseded indictment changed the course and direction of prosecution, which in turn alters the defense reaction. With the inaugural reports in detail released to news organizations and available on the internet, the government's propaganda had fulfilled its obligation to educate the public and destroy my credibility. The controller of the narrative always has power. The new indictment was primarily multiple count of tax cases. One, failure to file tax ba taxes based upon the, what the government had determined was misused. And two, filing false tax returns because I filed tax returns that did not include the amount the government had determined was misused. In addition, my companies were indicted on similar tax issues. Of course, I was the CEO of the company, so I would still be the person liable to face the consequences. Little had changed except for the terminology. The fear of the inevitable would not change the obstacles to be confronted. My mindset was to minimize the threat and function as best I could without allowing fear to invoke its paralysis. I had to continue functioning. The new indictment pushed back the trial start date. The further off the trial date, the more assured of freedom I, I could enjoy. I was able to secure, secure a trip to my firstborn Sean's graduation from North Carolina State University. The question was raised inquiring why was I requesting travel permission to go to Raleigh? My response was simple, because I am a good father. 
My own graduation was completely destroyed as the judge would not permit me to travel to Cincinnati to complete my doctoral studies in interdisciplinary studies with a specialization in public policy health at the Union Institute and University. So many things were, be were being dismantled. I had to think back to the people I had assisted on numerous occasions. Were they really that hateful? Did they really want to destroy my life? Were they that envious and jealous? What drives people to want to totally annihilate another's life? What is that individual's reward? Do you get to gloat? I destroyed that person's life. I did it. What medal do you wear proudly for destroying an individual and a family unit? I recall the words spoken supernaturally into my spirit. Do not get bitter. I never wish to take on any of the ways of the oppressor. Becoming a vindictive person would rob me of my creativity to help and serve others. Social, black experience. Life has two rules. Number one, never quit. Number two, always remember rule number one, Duke Ellington. When standing is the only option. I was known as a thoroughbred during my heyday on the streets. I did what I said I would do, and I kept my mouth shut, especially when the occasion would cause someone else to suffer. Today, I'm referred to as a gray head, old head, or an OG. Jackie and I discussed what a guilty plea might look like. Her stance, if you have not done anything, why would you plead guilty? Going to trial was part of my DNA. It was customary for the U.S. attorney to offer a plea deal, a, re a reduced sentence for taking what was called taking responsibility. My condition for taking responsibility would be probation and opportunity to make restitution. The government offer was three years and a list of other people that I would have to bring into a conspiracy to defraud camps. I would have to lie to comply with that plea bargain. It was enough that my life and family were being destroyed. I would not do that to anyone else and their family. My response was, box them up, which is a reference to get a jury in place for a trial. For me, standing up for what I knew to be a true value was the only option. I had played this game so many times, there was no way for me to live with myself by shipwrecking others to shave a few years off my sentence. I never informed those on the list. It did reveal the extreme people in position of, of power will go to pad their record at the expense of other people, oftentimes innocent people. For me, minister, pastor, and preacher equal to gray head, old head, and OG were synonymous with being a stand-up brother who is willing to take the weight. There are some actions that defy logic and reasoning, yet it is the right thing to do. Silence can be painful. An old acquaintance from the East Coast came to visit me in Solon, Ohio. He shared that I still had friends on the East Coast. His conversation reminded me of favors that I had done in years past, that I never sought any compensation. His statement was precise. You know, if there are no witnesses, there will be no trial. I thank him for his concern. I asked him to express my acknowledgement to past associates. However, I had a different life to live regardless of these current circumstances. Temptations come in many forms. Some others came to me during this time asking questions when I knew they were wearing a wire. Retribution was not my order of thought. 
I was set upon overcoming and continuing to live a life of productivity. My mission remained to leave this world at my egress or transition a, a better place than when I entered at advent or birth. Theological, keep and guard your heart with all vigilance and above all that you guard for out of it flow the springs of life. Proverbs 4.23, Amplified Bible Classic Edition. In search of an anchor. In the midst of crises, the important personal anthem is to keep your heart and guard what is left of it. Each time something rips at the emotional fabric of my heart, I instinctively place an alert to keep track of what remains. My guard goes up to make sure that I can still function with whatever percentage remains intact. Once the fiber of the heart has been penetrated, the protective mechanism flashed to the point of pain. It is essential to protect the heart for a broken heart will lead to malfunctions in every part of the human makeup. A broken heart can set an entire life drifting aimlessly. The struggle to retain control of the heart presents the battle for a quality life existence. All that flows as the spring of life originates from the heart, that is compassion or passion. Any sustainable damage to the heart will mandate the need for an anchor. The heart serves as the stability of all other life functions as well as the seat of vulnerability. I have had to rescue my heart from aimless drifting on numerous occasions. It would be a great theological reply to say it all, it has always been by my faith. Perhaps I did not know I had faith, or it may have been faith, but not in a religious context. The search for me has been to discover an anchor that would hold through all season, as well as through the most horrific storm life has pitched my way.